Uh, I've called this lecture Demystifying Statistics, uh, which is probably a bit of a grandiose claim, and uh, I'm probably not going to do anything of the sort. But what I'm hoping to do in this lecture is to go over some, some sort of quite basic ideas of what we're trying to do when uh, we do statistics in psychology, because you know, I think it's fair to say a lot of people come to do their psychology degree not really wanting to do statistics. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's important to try and give you a more positive spin on what we're doing over this module. So what I hope by the end of today is uh, that you should recognise the importance of statistics as a key life skill. You may not think it is, but I'm going to try and convince you that it is. And uh, I'm going to have a look at base the basic idea of fitting models to the data, and then I'm going to talk about what I call the only equation you'll ever need, uh, which is an attempt to cross your fears early on in the course and to make you feel very positive about everything, because uh, that's okay. good. So this is how I imagine my statistics lectures to be. So, if uh, anyone, you know, small and bespectacled, could sit at the front and answer all my questions, that would that would be great. So, I think students should love statistics as much as the little boy in that uh, clip of Doctor Who. Now, why do I think this? Well. I think that you know, at university, as well as learning about you know, the thing that you came to learn about, like psychology, we try to uh, kind of give you transferable skills is the term. And uh, I think of all the transferable skills you get out of a psychology degree, statistics is quite an important one. So there was a paper uh, a few years ago which uh, identified five core skills that they believe that, uh, I think it was actually social science, not necessarily psychologists particularly, they should sort of come out of their degree knowing these things. And I think basically everyone in this room, by the time you've left your degree, and possibly even now, just after having your first year, these are all things that you, know, you probably have some, some awareness of already. So she said uh, that it's impor important to know when you can infer causal relationships from things and when you can't, which probably was covered a bit last year. The difference between statistical significance and practical importance. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about that in uh, the, the lecture next Wednesday. The difference between finding no effect and finding a statistically significant effect. That kind of relates to the one before, actually. So, again, we'll, we'll sort of delve into that a bit next week. Sources of bias. So, this is sort of research design things. So, uh, you know, knowing about poor wording of questions and uh, response biases and things like that, which I reckon uh, those of you that did the first year here will know about. And understanding that variability is natural and that normal is not the same as average. So a good example of this is child development. I'm at the, the, the kind of age where lots of my friends are having uh, children and they do seem to kind of go through periods of worrying quite a lot about, you know, little Alfie hasn't learned calculus yet and he's 18 months that sort of thing. And um, it's kind of because, you know, in the books, you get all these sort of averages, like, you know, the average age that your child will, uh, you know, start to crawl is such and such. Uh, and, uh, if, you know, if your child hasn't crawled by that date, you suddenly sort of think that they're developmentally, you know, have a developmental problem or something. Because a lot of people don't understand that an average is an average, and there's variability around that average. And, uh, you know, basically, as long as you know, your child's going to crawl when it's going to crawl, pretty much. And on average, that will be at a certain point in time. But some babies crawl earlier and some babies crawl later. And there's a, a sort of a, you know, a, a, a range of, of normality, if you like. And that things only become problematic at more extremes. So, you know, your basic understanding of things like, you know, variance and standard deviations and things like that and distributions of scores sets you in good stead when you're a, a parent or if you're a parent one day to, to not panic about your child's development. But there are more useful things as well, like if you have blood tests and things like that and your doctor's telling you, uh, you know, that your, your levels of, I'm going to show my ignorance of what's in blood. Blood's got stuff in it, right, but that they measure at the doctor's probably. Um, so they'll say, oh, you know, your levels of stuff in your blood are, uh, you know, 196 one, and they ought to be 200, uh, you know, because on average they're 200. And you can say, well, you know, what's the normal range? Is, is that a, com you know, give me a confidence interval around that value. And they'll say, uh, fuck off. <laughs> 
But nevertheless, um, you know, it's good. So what I think uh, knowing a bit about statistics does for you is um, it gives you, you know, a bit, of a, a bit of an advantage over an intelligent layperson. Now, so that you can recognise yourself as scientists from intelligent lay people, uh, I put a picture of some intelligent lay people who are my parents. And uh, they're very sweet, very intelligent. They didn't go to university because uh, you know, they, they come from working class background and people didn't go to university back then. Uh, but they're very clever people. Um, but you know, they don't know anything about science. So uh, they're, they're good people to use. So why does it give you an advantage? Well, here's an example of a news story uh, that's a couple of years old now. And uh, my wife found this for me because uh, she, she's interested in this sort of thing. Being, uh, being a woman and everything. I'm not saying that. Yeah, I'm just. Oh, shut up. Anyway, uh, she was in, she was interested. She thought this was interesting. Anyway, uh, so there were these news stories uh, going around. That basically, there was a story saying that taking the, the contraceptive pill may lead to a permanent loss of sex drive, as you can see from the headline. So, you know, how does the contraceptive pill work? Well, it just it stops you wanting to have sex. So. This is what the Daily Mail said. Uh, I like to pick on the Daily Mail for no apparent reason. Women may suffer a permanent decline in sex drive after taking the contraceptive pill, researchers have said. They also said a number of sexual dysfunction effects are associated with the pill, including dulled libido. Until now, it's always been assumed that these are reversible and cease to be a problem as soon as the woman comes off the pill. But new research suggests that the effects on libido might be long-lasting or permanent! A team of American researchers studied 125 young women attending a sexual dysfunction clinic. 62 were taking oral contraceptives, 40 had previously taken them, and 23 had never been on the pill. The scientists measured le le levels of SHBG, which is uh, related to testosterone, but beyond that, don't ask me. Um, but well, what I do know is high levels of it are su supposed to be indicators of low libido. Uh, anyway, they measured that in the women every three months for a year and found that they were seven times higher! That's low libido. Uh, in users of the pill, oh, it, when, when you like watch this on the lecture capture, don't have your headphones up too loud. <laughs> um, in users of the pill, than women who had never taken them. And uh, levels declined in women who had stopped taking the pill, but remained three to four times higher than they were uh, in those with no history. So basically... Yeah, they're the facts, according to the mail. Now, you, as educated uh, uh, scientists who know a bit about research methods and statistics, the advantage you have over, say, my parents, my parents would just read that and pretty much believe it, I reckon, and that's, that's not being mean about my parents, it's just, you know, if it's in a newspaper, why wouldn't you believe it? Well, all, all sorts of reasons, but anyway. You could look at the data, so here are the data from that study. Now, there's a, there's a few things I want to point out here. So, first of all, uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can get the wiggly pen to work. Wiggly, oh, wiggly pen. Right, there we go. Uh, so, this is baseline. So, this is before anything's happened. You've got two groups of people who are taking the oral contraceptive and one group of people who have never taken it. That's the, the white bar. So what the Daily Mail was saying is that people taking the contraceptive pill have levels of this hormone-y thing that they measured uh, that are seven times higher than those who've never taken the pill. The thing they neglect to mention is that this is a baseline, so this is before anyone's come off uh, the contraceptive pill. But nevertheless, you know, so is it seven times higher? Well, basically in this group, the levels are, you know, it's a bit hard to tell, probably around 30 or you know, 35, 40, something like that. The top level up here is something like 150. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, when I did maths, uh, that's not seven times as much. If it was seven times as much, it'd be more in the region of about 250, something like that. So I just have, I literally, I've read this paper a number of times, I literally have no idea where the seven times higher comes from. It's just wrong, as far as I can tell. Um, but anyway, that's not really the main issue. The main issue is what happens when you come off the pill. So uh, we've got, uh, an amount of days later. So uh, they said it was a year later. It, it's actually not a year later at all. It's uh, over 120 days, but not a year. Some people it was a year, but not everyone. Anyway, uh, so you've got people staying on the pill, so of course their levels of the hormone don't change. You've got people never on the pill, and of course their levels are pretty similar to what they were at baseline. But then you've, this is the crucial group in the middle, 
are the ones who discontinue. So the male was focusing on the fact that those who discontinue, their levels of this uh, SHBG thing were still much, much higher than the baseline. But actually, I mean, the thing that you might want to focus on is there is a massive decline. So they said research, uh, you know, scientists always believed that when you come off the pill, you know, these things decline. Well, they do. And actually, they decline quite a lot. But they're focusing on the fact that there's a difference here. And they say that that difference is three to four times higher. And again, if you actually look at the numbers, although we can only approximate them from the graph, it's nowhere near three to four. It's something like around two times higher. So where does this leave you as uh, people who have uh, studied a bit about research methods and statistics? When you leave university reading a newspaper headline, and okay, you might not give a damn about the contraceptive pill, but you might come across a news story based on some bit of science that, that matters to you or you know, some treatment that's going on or something that affects your children. <laughs> My thing's not working anymore. Work. Uh, so you could copy edit this Daily Mail story. So the first thing we might do in the, in the first bit of their report, we might add that the women in the study already had sexual dysfunction, uh, a fact that the male neglect to mention. So they're not representative of the population as a whole, they're representative of a population of people who already have sexual dysfunction problems. Um, so they say they may suffer a permanent, well, it's not really permanent, it's up to three to six months or a year if you take the extremes of what they measured. Uh, so that they, they suffer a, uh, a three to six month decline in levels of this hormone, not libido, because they didn't actually measure libido at all. They measured a hormone. So what about the next thing they said? Until now, it's always been assumed that these, are, these effects are reversible. And in the current, we could add to this, in the current research, SHBG levels did actually decline a lot after coming off the pill. Uh, they also say uh, that the, the effects of this uh, lowered libido may be long lasting or permanent. You might add to that, even though we only have data over, on average, three to six months, which is not really permanent at all. Scientists measured levels of uh, SHBG in the women every three months for a year. Well, actually, some of them got measured for a year, but the, the average amount of uh, follow-up was actually three to six months. And found that they were seven, in a parallel universe where seven equals four, times higher at baseline, not after they'd come off the pill, in use of the pill than women who'd never taken them. Levels declined in women who'd stopped taking the pill but remained three to four times higher in another parallel universe where three to four means about 1.83 uh, than those with no history of using it. However, another thing they didn't mention, women in the discontinued group were followed up actually for less time than uh, those in the never used group. So they, they were followed up about 73, on average, 73 days earlier. So there's a, map, there's a confound in the study. They're not comparing like for like when, at their final time point. And finally, all these claims about libido, they never actually measured subjective libido. So we could add a caveat to uh, the, the Daily Mail piece, just saying, you know, just bear in mind, this is a hormone, it might be indicative of libido, but we never actually measured their subjective libido at all, so we don't really know what's going on uh, from a libido point of view. So, statistics, I think, gives you a lot of, a lot of power to negotiate the media and the world, and you're, you'll be bombarded with statistics, not just in... Uh, the world of psychology or if you stay in research but you know on the news in newspapers on websites whatever and I think you're in a very lucky position in that hopefully by the end of, uh, of all the things we're going to teach you about research methods and statistics you're in a, a good position to evaluate evidence for yourself and make informed decisions and not just be told stuff and blindly accept it so that's my positive spin on, on statistics for the day. So why is it that a lot of students hate statistics? Well, again, I think this, this clip illustrates it. If, it. if it will work, work. It's the pen. I'm doing the pen thing. It always ruins everything. There we go. Why the next number in the sequence? 313? 3 What? You said the criminal answers. What? It's a So I think, uh, don't worry, no, no questions on the exam about happy primes, whatever he said they were. Um, 
Why do people not or, uh, get scared of statistics? Well, I think it's because you get bombarded with things like this. You get bombarded with lots of equations. And in a way, although I don't think people do it deliberately, there's a sense in which I think people try to, to confuse you. Not, you know, not deliberately, but I think people just make things more complicated than they need to be. So what I'm going to attempt to do is to make things uncomplicated. I may fail completely, but you know, my intentions are honourable and pure and nice. Um, so I think you don't really need to bother with all of those other equations. We are going to come across a few equations on this course, but not very many. But I think basically there's only one equation that you ever really need to understand to understand everything about psychological statistics. And it's a pretty simple equation. And we can even get rid of like letters and things and actually replace things with words, because words are much easier to understand than individual letters. Now, in psychology and social science generally, what we're trying to do is to predict, and although you, you, know, you might think about prediction uh, in the context of very specific tests, like regression, actually, we're always trying to predict something. We're always trying to make some kind of guess about what's going on in the world. So we're trying to predict an outcome variable, and we're trying to predict that from some kind of model that we've fitted to the data. Models are never perfect fits of the data, ever. So there's always going to be some error attached to that model. And that's basically all you need to know. All that changes slightly, and not too much, is what we put in the bracket, so what the model is. But essentially, we're always trying to predict an outcome from a model, and the model has some kind of error attached. So why is it that we fit models to our data? So why, why is there a word model in there? Well, essentially, it's because we don't have access to all the people, or, uh, as psychologists, all the people that we might want to know something about. So if you're an engineer, heaven forbid, or uh, an architect or something like that, then uh, and someone said to you, go build me a bridge across this river. Now, what would you do? Would you go out into the world and just build a bridge, you know, phone up B and Q, who clearly don't supply bridge builders, but uh, phone up B and Q and say, oh yeah, can I have uh, I don't know, a couple of tons of bricks, a few steel rods, a bit of concrete. Uh, um, I don't really know what else goes in a bridge, really. I'm not even sure that they do, but um, B and Q certainly don't. But um, you know, send me, send me some, because uh, I've got to build a bridge uh, tomorrow. Is that all right? Okay. And then you'd get there, you go, oh, well, I've got some bricks, got some concrete, got some, uh, you know, metal -y stuff. Um, and you just sling something together and, you know, then let people drive over it. You wouldn't do that because, you know, you'd be a nice, compassionate person who doesn't want people to die. So what you do instead is you build a scaled-down model. You don't want to waste loads of money building a real bridge, so you build a scaled-down model and you see how that performs in the real world. So, for example, I have scaled down Lego model of a bridge. And there's some people on it, driving along, they're quite happy, brum, brum, brum. <laughs> I found this Lego in my attic yesterday, along, along with the corpses of all my ex-students. Um, so you build a bridge, and then you would subject that bridge to some tests, because you need to know how it performs in the real world. So you might want to know, well, is it, I mean, it, it looks fairly sturdy. Uh, so you might want to know, well, does it, how does it perform when there's wind around? So you might, you, know, you might put in a wind tunnel, something like that. You might, uh, you know, you might have a fake river underneath and lash it with some waves. You might also wonder what on earth would be the effect if one day down the river there was a pink river hippo, and he came swimming along. Pink, pink river hippos do this. They swim along rivers, and they go. Well, it stood up pretty well. Well, you know, it's on its side, but the actual structure is intact. Uh, the uh, the uh, people not so intact. So that would be a good test that that bridge, you know, uh, assuming it was attached to the ground, could survive the pink river hippo attack. And I think architects should, you know, architects should pay more attention to the dangers of the pink river hippo. They neglect it. They always do wind tunnels and they put loads of rain and stuff like that and all, you know, all sorts of, put loads of traffic and weight on it. They never, they never test out the pink river hippo. And you know, they attack when you least expect it. Next time you're going over a bridge and you think you're safe, you, you do, well, I mean, if you're driving, obviously don't look over the side. 
But if you're a passenger, look over the side and you might see the little, the little pink back of a hippo waiting to jump out and strike when you're least expecting it. And when that day comes, <laughs> you'll be glad that your architect tested out the sturdiness of the bridge against hippo attack. What has this got to do with psychology? Well, like most of my stories, not a lot. Um, But essentially, psychologists are trying to do uh, the the, the same thing. So we want to know something about, I mean, actually, basically, we want to know something about humans across the board. And that's a a huge, variable, heterogeneous group of people. But that's essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out truths about the human mind, not the mind of a particular subgroup of humans, but just humans generally. Or, uh, you know, if you're a comparative psychologist, you might want to know, you know about monkeys rather than humans. I don't know. Um, you don't have access to all of those. So, uh, you know, you're, the sort of real-world bridge, really, is this sort of population of people that you want to know how they perform under certain conditions. You want to predict what they're going to do. But you don't have access to it. You can't really do it. So what you need to do is instead build a model. And you build that model in a scaled-down way. So we take samples of people and the bigger the samples the better but, but you know generally actually as you'll discover we don't take huge samples although we probably should take bigger ones than we do so we take smaller samples of people and then we test out things we work out how they behave in certain conditions and we build this model this scaled down model we fit this model to our data just you know kind of like the, the scaled down bridge and we make predictions then based on this model and what we hope is that by building this model in a, in a smaller group of people, it will apply to kind of everyone. We can sort of extrapolate upwards and say, well, you know, our little model predicts this. This is how it, how it behaves in certain conditions, just like our little bridge. So hopefully, if we kind of uh, take that you know, to the whole population, we would get the same effects. So we build models in samples. We check out how well they represent the sample, so what their, their fit is. And then we sort of uh, extrapolate them upwards to the population. And and we make an assumption that that's a reasonable thing to do. We make an assumption that if our model is a good fit of our sample, then it will also be a good fit of the population. Now, there's all sorts of debates you can have around, you know, whether that's likely to be true or not. But essentially, if certain assumptions are met, and uh, if our model is a good fit, there doesn't seem to be too much error in it, then it's reasonable to assume that we can use it to, to make wider predictions about people that we haven't, uh, we haven't measured. So all this model building, is, uh, it's really a similar process to, uh, you know, if you, if you can't get access to the, the thing you actually want to know about, you scale it down, you try to make that scaled down model as close to reality as you can, so you want the sample to be representative of, of you know, people generally. And then you, tr- you fit a model, and if that model's a good fit of the data, you assume that it's reasonable to uh, draw conclusions about the population. So that's what we mean by model fitting. So two important concepts are simply that we take samples and we fit models to them. And once we've fitted a model, we have to work out whether it's a good fit or a bad fit. And we're going to come back to that in the lecture next week. But as long as you just get the idea that you know, we're fitting models, that's a good thing. So, zombies. In my spare time, I'm a member of the undead, uh, as you can see. And um, some, some, some would argue not, even, not just in my spare time. Um, so, uh, when we fit a model, what kind of model do we fit? That's what this zombie quiz is all about. So we're going to do a short... Well, it's not really a quiz. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to hope that someone can answer it. Um, so I've noticed that if, if you look, you know, there's lots of like, places around campus that you can buy sandwiches. And uh, near my office is a tea bar on the bridge uh, that goes over some road that I don't know the name of. Um, and they, they sell all sorts of things. And one of the things they sell in there, believe it or not, is that, like when you buy your main meal, you get the choice. You can have a salad bar... Or you can choose chips, but you can either choose potato chips or they also serve brain chips because a lot of members of academia are actually the walking dead. And um, the walking dead like, like brain chips. So um, 
you get the choice. Now, I was interested in, in whether, you know, because you see on the movies and everything, zombies are always into eating brains. You know, that's kind of what they do. Um, it's, you know, they're not, not so good on the vegetarianism. And um, I wanted to see, well, you know, are they, are they kind of being hard done by? So I collected some data. I, I sat in the tea bar with a little pen and a pencil and a notepad. And I noted down everyone going to the tea bar. And uh, I made an educated guess of whether they were a human or a zombie uh, based on a number of criteria, look, smell, whether anything fell off while they were in the queue, that sort of thing. Um, and then I, I looked at their dinner and uh, saw whether they'd chosen the brain chips or the potato chips. So I've got uh, an amount of participants there. And uh, so they're all categorized into different cells. So they could either be a human or a zombie, can't be both. And they could either have brain chips or potato chips, but not both. So for example, we know that 61 of the zombies that I observed chose brain chips, and 57 of the zombies that I observed had potato chips. How should I analyze these data? What, what test or model should I fit? There's a chocolate in it. Not the whole Chi square. Who agrees with chi, chi square? By show of hands. A few people. Uh, do you have a preference for chocolate? Anything. I normally throw these. But have a caramel. Chi square. That's a perfectly sensible answer. And as you will see from the slide, chi square test. So, uh, those of you uh, who agreed, well done. It's a chi-square test. And you'll notice that when you do a chi-square test, you get a significance value of uh, 0.12. So, it's not, not a significant relationship, essentially. <laughs> now, the question is, you presumably think there was only one correct answer to that question, I guess. Yeah? Well, should we see what happens if we try out some other statistical tests? Now you've been told, in that situation, that's absolutely what, that's the model you should fit. You should do a chi-square test, right? So what would happen, do you think, if, for example, we did a Spearman correlation? That's not going to work, is it? Because it's categorical data and categorical data. You can't do a Spearman correlation on that. If you do one, you probably think that the world will end. But it doesn't. You can do one. And what do you find? You get a significance of 0.12, exactly the same as what you got from a chi-square test. But perhaps I'm tricking you, and you know this is a, a special spearman -y thing, where like you know Spearman becomes friends with chi-square, and they make a pact to give you the same result. Uh, what about Kendall's tau correlation? Oh look, you get exactly the same result, significance of 0.12. But okay, they're all non-parametric tests, right? So maybe. You know, there's a little cult of non-parametric tests, and they all meet in like a secret Victorian gentleman's club of a weekend, and they, uh, you know, take opium and discuss ways in which they're going to confuse everyone by giving you the same result. So we could try Pearson correlation, because Pearson, that's a non-parametric, and if you do non-parametric, uh, sorry, it's a parametric test, and if you do parametric tests on categorical data, what happens? Armageddon! That's what happens. That's what you've been told. Armageddon. If you do a parametric test on non-parametric data, the world, it will literally end. Or not. You actually get the same result. So we can try out some other things. What about t-test? Same result. What about one-way ANOVA? Same result. What about linear regression? Same result. Wilcoxon test, same result. Crystal Wallace test, same result. Logistic regression, you don't even know what that is. But it still gives you the same result. Ordinal logistic regression or plum, I don't even know what that is. But I do know it gives you exactly the same result. Linear mixed models, same. Discriminant function analysis, what? Same result. So, when you come across diagrams like this in the back of textbooks, like mine, um, and it gets you to ask, uh, you know, answer lots and lots of questions, like, you know, 
Where was your mother born? How many siblings have you got? Do you have a cat? Does your cat like tuna? Does it only eat fresh tuna? Do you have a dog? Does the dog and cat get on? And then once you've answered all those, it goes, oh, you need to do a regression. Um, they're, in a way, they're a bit pointless. Now, they're a useful thing because the, the way that SPSS organises tests is, uh, is well, and the way that tests are often taught, as, are such that you know, they're in different menus and they're doing different things in a way. So you kind of need diagrams like this to tell you from a practical point of view what to do. But actually, what is underlying every single test that you will ever do in uh, social statistics for psychology, uh, you are doing what's known as a general linear model, or GLM. So when you look at one of these figures, if you want to be a smart ass at a pub quiz, uh, this probably won't help because they'll never ask you this question. Um, but, you know, say you're in a pub quiz and someone, for some bizarre reason, said, uh, you know, how would you analyse these data? Even if you don't know, just say general linear model and you'll probably be right. So what is a general linear model and why am I telling you about it? Well, it relates back to this idea of there only actually being one equation you ever need to know. So as I said, you know, SPSS, pack, well, and, you know, in many ways, not just SPSS, but different tests or models are packaged up in different ways, so they're given different names and you know, you're told to use them in certain contexts and things like that. But the model underlying them all is essentially the same. They can all more or less be represented by a very, very simple model. And that model is this. So if we replace the word model with some actual like numbers, uh, sorry, letters and things, we get B0 plus B1 X1. Does that seem familiar to anyone? What is it? Um. <laughs> you can have a chocolate anyway. <laughs> just, just, just for putting your hand up. <laughs> Sorry, who? Well done. Who, who said that? Oh man. I'm just. Oh, I'm going to risk it. I'm going to risk it. Oh, well done. Yeah, brilliant. It's the equation of a straight line. So hopefully you would have uh, come across it last year. That's The equation of a straight line is a linear model. Linear just means straight line. So most of the things we're doing, so especially on this course, we're going to do a bit of regression, we're going to do a bit of ANOVA. Both of them are linear models. So ANOVA is packaged in a different way, but underneath it all is the same basic model, the same equation, this, this B0 plus B1X1. And... Uh, so we're, we're, we're going to kind of come back to this equation quite a lot. But that's the only thing you really need to understand. Does anyone remember what uh, the B0 is? You might have, like, A-level, this might have been uh, Y equals MX plus C, maybe. I don't know if they're still teaching like that. Sorry? Constant. Constant, yes. It's, um, it's basically the, the value that you would predict. Oh, sorry, chocolate. Who said that? Fudge okay? Yep. <laughs> so B0 is like a, a constant. So in regression, it quite often gets called the intercept. But in a way, I'd rather you didn't think of it as an intercept because uh, that's, that's a bit too wedded to, to regression. But it's basically, a, it's a constant. It's the value of the outcome when our predictor variables, whatever variable we've measured that we're trying to predict the outcome from, is zero. So it's just, it's kind of a constant. It's the value of the outcome you get when you don't have any predictors. And beta 1, the other beta in there, is it's what's known as a parameter. Now, a parameter is a bit of a scary word, in a way. Uh, and I don't like using it, but you kind of find that you have to use it, because uh, lots of other people do. Uh, but it's, no, it's known as a parameter. All a parameter really means is it's, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a parameter. <laughs> it's, it's something that can be different or vary, essentially. So it ends up being a number. It's something we have to estimate. And what it tells us about, again, in regression, you would know about it as the, the gradient or the slope of the line. But uh, again, because that's very wedded to the, to the idea of regression, I'd rather you just thought about it as being a measure of the, the direction or the strength of the relationship. Now, the key thing is here, you're used to seeing this equation in the context of regression. So you're used to predicting an outcome from some you know, continuous variable that you've measured. But actually, that variable doesn't have to be continuous, as we'll see so basically, if you, understand, uh, if you understand the idea of predicting an outcome from a model plus some error, and you understand, broadly speaking, what the, the B0 plus B1X1 means, 
then you're pretty sorted. That is more or less all you need to know about the models that we fit in psychology. <coughs> so uh, to give you an example, here's a photo of my wife and I at uh, the Download Festival this year, which was uh, very muddy. Now, uh, I like festivals. Uh, possibly if we have children, we'll not be able to go to them anymore. Uh, so, you know, we're getting some in while we can. And, um, I, you know, festivals are interesting things. They're good for people watching because you get all sorts of peculiar people there. You know, ev everything from statistics lecturers to, uh, you know, even stranger people. And... Um, I often wonder, you know, whether you could make a good prediction about how smelly people are based on how many days they've been at festivals. Festivals are pretty, uh, you know, they, they put a lot of pressure on your um, ability to remain clean and fragrant. So we could, for example, use a linear model or use this model that I've just talked about to predict smelliness. And our predictor variable could be days at the festival, for example. So is it the case that the, the longer you're at the festival, the more days you're at the festival, the more you smell. In which case, this beta one thing would be some kind of measure of that relationship between the two variables. So it would be an, a, kind of an estimate of it, really. So if it's a, you know, it's a positive B, then that means that there's a positive relationship. The more you're at the festival, the smellier you get. And we have this constant in there, which just tells us how smelly you would be if you didn't go to the festival at all, essentially. It's kind of like the average amount of smelliness in general. So we'll have a look at some uh, familiar models. So first of all, you, uh, you might think, well, the mean is not really related to this at all. So, uh, you know, I probably, you know, if I'm saying this is the only equation you ever need, I'm probably wrong about the mean. Well, actually, I'm not. It's just we can, we can talk about the mean in this way, but we just, the model just gets a bit simpler. Because if we're using a mean to, to kind of make a prediction about someone, we're not using any other variable, so basically that means that we, we kind of get rid of the x from the equation and we don't really need the constant either. So when we talk about the mean, we're still using this outcome equals model plus error, but the model is, is just a parameter. So it's just a single b on its own. And normally, like you represent a mean by x bar, but it can, it can I like to just use b because they're all parameters really, they're all things that you estimate. Again, we're going to come back to this in the next lecture, but I just want to sort of point out here, the mean basically is, this, is still this model, this idea of predicting an outcome from a model, and that model will have some parameters in it. A correlation is basically the same model, it's just you don't need the beta zero. And the reason you don't need the beta zero is because uh, when you do a correlation, you standardise the variables, so the beta zero drops out of the equation. But... If none of that made any sense, it doesn't really matter. It, all that matters is now the model gets a bit more developed because we have some kind of predictor variable in there as well. And we have a beta that kind of goes along. It's like a, a little friend of that predictor variable that tells us about the relationship between the two. Regression, as we've already talked about, is exactly the same. But, you know, we, we, we get a beta zero in there as well. But the only reason for that is because regression is always done on the raw data, not the standardised data. So we have to have the beta zero in there to, to tell us what the outcome would be if, uh, if we didn't have any predictors. But you might think we can't represent a t-test as this kind of model, but actually we can. A t-test can be represented in exactly the same way as regression. The only difference is where I've got predictor, that predictor variable is groups. It's sort of numbers representing groups. And you have to code the groups in a, in a, a very specific kind of way and you're not actually going to have to ever do that. But I just want to make the point that a t-test is the same model as a, as a linear regression. It's, it's actually no different at all. And we will come back to this. So to make this a bit more concrete, um, here's a Harry Potter example. I've never read the Harry Potter books. I'm probably the only person in the universe. Um, I don't know why I've never read them. Pro there's not enough statistics in there, probably. That would be the reason. Um, but I do know, because... Uh, uh, we, on our honeymoon, we went to, um, uh, what was it called? That place in America, Disneyland. That's the one. Uh, and uh, we went to Universal Studios where they, now they have a Harry Potter ride, right? So I'm a bit more educated about Harry Potter because I went on this ride. It did, if I'm honest, nearly make me vom. But um, it was very, it was impressive, very visually impressive. Uh, but my brain was finding it a bit difficult to cope with uh, all the sensory input. Um, 
Anyway, so what I do know is there was a cloak of invisibility in Harry Potter at some point, uh, which is why there's this kind of crazy disembodied head on my slide. And uh, I thought, well, you know, you could do a nice experiment around whether having a cloak of invisibility makes you engage in more mischievous acts. Because I like to think that um, if I had a cloak of invisibility, although I think i definitely like do some nice things, uh, you know, like, I don't know, but nice sort of in, invisible things, like you could be like a bunch of flowers going along the road and you could just give, give yourself to someone and you wouldn't have that whole embarrassment of like, why is a complete stranger giving me flowers? Because the person would just think, oh look, some floating flowers have decided to make my day a bit more jolly by floating into my arms. They've selected me out of the entire human race to uh, be their owner and that's nice. Uh, so you could do that sort of thing. But I think I'm pretty sure, because I have a bit of a mischievous streak, that I'd probably get up to some mischief as well. But I'm pretty certain there'd be some mischief going on. So you could do an experiment where, you know, you, you could do it in a number of ways. You could either sort of uh, measure, like, how long someone wears an invisibility cloak uh, versus how much mischief they get up to or, you know, how many days per week they have it on. Or you could do it more by grouping people. So have a control condition who are not given cloaks of invisibility and an experimental group who are given cloaks of invisibility and see, uh, again, count the number of mischievous acts they get up to. So the point is, our, we'd be predicting mi mischievous acts. That would be our outcome, or you may, have, you may be more familiar with dependent variable, but I'm going to talk about outcomes, not dependent variables, but they're the same thing. Um, and our predictor is going to be uh, invisibility. So either you could do that categorically, whether you have a cloak or you don't have a cloak, or you could do that continuously, maybe. So degree of invisibility or... Uh, you know, amount per week you wear your cloak or something like that. And the model will stay the same. So in, in the mean, for example, we'd be predicting like the average level of mischief. So we'd be making our prediction about mischief making based only on the average amount of mischief, you know, across the whole sample. Uh, and that, you know, that's, a, that's an okay, it's not, it's not a great model, but it's a reasonable model. We use the mean a lot. We could look at the correlation between if invisibility was measured like in terms of degree of invisibility or number of days per week you wear the cloak, you could do a correlational type thing and the, the, the model is just, you know, you predict mischief from invisibility and you have this beta that quantifies that relationship. In regression it's the same, you just have a predictor invisibility and an outcome mischief and you quantify that relationship with a beta, but you also have that constant in there. And again, if, you, if, you, if your invisibility variable was groups of people, those with cloaks and those without cloaks, the model actually doesn't change. All that changes is the nature of the invisibility variable. It's just be it's become categorical. Now, like I said, from a pragmatic point of view, when you do these things on SPSS, you're not aware of what's going on behind the scenes, and, and they appear to be different things. And I'm just trying to... I mean, really, the whole purpose of this lecture is to try to show you that actually we only ever really fit one model, this linear model. And regardless of what we're doing in SPSS, or regardless of the, the maths we're doing if we do it by hand, conceptually we're always doing the same thing. We're always fitting a linear model. All that changes is the, the type of variables that we use. And that affects the maths behind the scenes. But uh, in 99% of cases, I, I don't know what the maths behind the scenes is, so I, I don't, I'm not in a position to tell you what they are or expect you to know. So just to summarise, um, I hope to uh, have convinced you to some degree or another that statistics is worth learning not just for the enrichment that you get from learning such an interesting topic, but because it's a useful life skill. And that although statistics can seem very complicated, it seems like there's a lot of different tests and a lot of different procedures that you have to think about and worry about. Actually, what's going on behind the scenes is always the same thing. It's this linear model. If you understand that linear model, then you've basically understood everything that you need to understand. So data analysis begins with a simple idea of fitting a model, and most of the classic tests that you will know of uh, are variations on this linear model. 